So, and hello everybody and thank you for coming. I hope you can all hear me. Um, I thought I would start with uh, the fact that the world we know is the result of ideas. And uh, <coughs> I want to start with the idea of Zionism, which is not a new idea at all. You have to go back to biblical times and the uh, Babylonian exile, uh, which has been, uh, uh, you can find the verses in the Bible by the river of uh, Babylon, uh, we sat and wept. Uh, uh, this was set to music by the famous Italian composer Giuseppe Verdi in his opera Nabucco uh, in the beautiful hymn of Va Pensiero. Some of you may have seen that. If you haven't, I would encourage you to, to listen to it. Um, so the yearning for Zion is an old story. And every year, uh, the next holiday that's coming up is Pesach, when we sing Lishana Haba Birushalayim next year in Jerusalem. A lot of people think that Zionism started as a, or the state of Israel started as a result of the Holocaust. That isn't quite accurate. Jews were persecuted in, uh, in Russia in particular, the pogroms. And at the turn of the century, many young Jews went to what was then Palestine, bought land, and uh, worked the land. They had to start by removing the stones before they could plant anything. And they also had to learn to do use drip irrigation and uh, desalination, which they are now experts in. So uh, Zionism is, uh, it's got the name maybe be new, but the idea of a return to Zion and to Jerusalem is a very old idea. Uh, at the turn of the century, the Austrian uh, writer, Theodor Herzl, uh, who was an assimilated Jew, uh, uh, became aware, of course, that assimilation and integration were not perfect. And, uh, and so he formalized the idea that we have to have a state of our own. That was the beginning, the birth of modern Zionism. So the uh, events of World War II were just the trigger. It was not the cause of the state of Israel. The idea has been, is as old as, as the Bible. As far as we are concerned, our culture is also the result of, uh, uh, the, our culture is also the result of ideas that are old. You have to go back to Greece and Rome to remember that that's where we learned about democracy, that's where we learned about living according to the rule of law, and, uh, and to the, which, which gave us the enlightenment, the founding fathers, the constitution, and this is on the uh, secular side, on the spiritual side. We are all the heirs of the Judeo-Christian tradition with the ethical code of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not uh, lie, thou shalt not go around murdering people, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not be jealous of what your neighbor has, and do unto others or don't do unto others as you would have, wouldn't you have others do unto you. This is the code of ethics we live by. Well, unfortunately for Germany and Russia, they did not abide by these ideas. They wanted modernity, they wanted progress, but they wanted to remain the boss. So instead of the enlightenment, which was, which was an increasing uh, liberalism, expanded, expanding suffrage, we got uh, enlightened despotism. That was the pattern of the, uh, oh, this is me up there. <laughs> I was on 60 Minutes a couple of months ago, so they might have, some of you might have seen me. Um, <coughs> with Anderson Cooper. Anyway, so the, they went into the direction of enlightened despotism, which is a tradition that continued. During the Romantic period in the 19th century, the, um, uh, let me see if I can handle this. This is me. Um, during the Romantic period, which uh, was also a broadening of the suffrage and of greater freedom uh, in the West, in England, in France, and in the United States, Again, Germany went in the wrong direction. They went into the direction of glorification of the common man, which gave us the slogan, the Nazi slogan, blood and soil. And you had a, uh, so you had the authoritarian tradition, you had a tra militarist tradition in the 17th and 18th centuries with the two uh, Fredericks. Uh, you had the uh, rabid nationalism, emphasis on ethnicity, and anti-Semitism, they were sort of a package deal. Uh, the unification of German-speaking lands was a 19th century idea because after Napoleon 
uh, there was no unified Germany. Germany was made up of 36 separate political entities. So the Germany we know, more or less, didn't come into being until 1871, which is almost 100 years after the United States. And people don't realize that either. So unification of German-speaking lands, which then gave Hitler the excuse for marching into Austria and for marching into the German-speaking part of Czechoslovakia, known as the Sudeten. Uh, we had the racist idea was also a 19th century idea. Unfortunately, we know something about that in this country, so I don't need to belabor it. And uh, finally, colonization of the lands to the east, which meant Poland, the Baltic states, and parts of Russia. These were all 19th century ideas that uh, the Nazis just picked up. All Hitler had to do was pa package it into an ideology. They were not original with the Nazis. I, I forgot to mention the personality cult, which uh, sort of started with uh, Napoleon, uh, and uh, it was made into a doctrine by the German philosopher Hegel, Friedrich Hegel. The military defeat of World War I was the trigger, along with the Depression, for the Nazis to rise. And the attitude was, you know, we got such macho, I mean, we are such a strong, we got such a strong military, how could we possibly have been defeated? They could not accept responsibility for the defeat, and so they said, aha, we have to find, it's not our fault, it's somebody else's fault. Whose fault was it? The Americans, the English, the French, and of course, the Jews. What did we have to do with it? Nothing, because Jews fought for Germany and Austria, just like American Jews fight for their own country. I have an uncle on my mother's side who fought, who died in, the, uh, in Italy in World War I fighting under the Austrian flag. But it, the truth, you see, doesn't matter. They forgot about the, uh, and the code of ethics. The truth doesn't matter. So both the defeat and the depression were the triggers. They were not the root cause of uh, Germany. Well, I grew up, I grew up uh, in the shadow of the rise of Nazism. So this is me, little old me, with my dad. On the, and, uh, and on the right, I'm at the Prater, the uh, famous amusement park in Vienna. It's my sixth birthday, and this is a special treat for me to go to the Prater. And of course, it's not a real horse, it's a paper mache horse. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, as you can see, I look pretty happy. Uh, um, that's me with my older right and with my older brother. For his bar mitzvah, he got a Kodak camera. And after that, we always had photographs. Uh, as you can see, my mom was a big lady, <laughs> a little bossy. And uh, so, and when I was a little girl, we didn't have many books. As soon as I learned to read, I'll never forget this, at the age of eight, I read Theodore Herzl's All New Land. Would you believe I brought the book with me because I still have the book that I read as a little girl. So, Ad Neuland in German, and uh, it's written, and you can look at it later if you want to. We, I don't know how my mother managed to schlep it across Europe while we were refugees, but here it is. I read it eight times. We didn't have many books at home because we were poor. My father was hit hard by the Depression, and so the books I had, and to give you a basis for comparison, another book I read, Mark Twain, uh, at the age of eight. Uh, I read The Prince and the Pauper. I used to read Walter Scott. I loved his stories of Ivanhoe and all the other stuff. The chivalry, that thing was exciting. I read stories, so I was very literate at the age of eight. Of course, being only eight years old, I skipped the theoretical passages about uh, the new state and, then, you know, and what the state is supposed to be like. But the one thing I remember in the story, because it's a love story, you, you know, he, he was a writer. Uh, he also wrote plays. So the one thing I remember in this story was that women are working. That was Tim. So I grew up with the idea, yeah, women can go out and get a job, you know, which at that time in the 30s was not a, a, a common idea that uh, women go to work. So this is a copy of the original edition, Alt Neuland. Old Neuland is the translation. If you want to look at it, you're welcome to. I was aware of the rise of the Nazis and uh, uh, because my parents used to discuss political events and uh, uh, they talked about the Sturmer and the Polkische Beobachter. I was aware of what was going on in Germany. And as far as Austria was concerned, I was remember I was in Vienna, they, ma they, uh, they murdered our chancellor. This is like, the, the, like a prime minister. And not only did they murder him, they shot him. But they had posted soldiers, Nazi soldiers, by his bedside, preventing him 
from getting any kind of medical aid, and so he was slowly forced to bleed to death. I was a little girl, and I was horrified. I was six years old, first grade. How can you do that? That was my first exposure to Nazi brutality. So, you know, I grew up knowing about Zionism and feeling about Zionism. When my brother was uh, after his bar mitzvah, this is my brother, the second from left in the group picture. He went on a summer camp, camp uh, organized by the Betar. I don't have that name there. And uh, uh, which was founded by, you see that, by the, uh, uh, by Jabotinsky. And, uh, and they, were, they were like Boy Scouts. They dressed like Boy Scouts. And I remember he came back very happy, singing all those songs about uh, Israel and about if this was at the time, you know, about uh, Zion and so on. So I grew up with that. This was sort of natural. Uh, during the 30s again, as soon as Hitler came to power, he burnt, uh, on the top right, he burnt the uh, German equivalent of Congress, the Reichstag. And the slogan here tells you, zerstampft den Kommunismus, zerschmettert die Sozialdemokratie, trample communism and shatter social democracy. So after 19, as soon as he came to power, this is February 28, like yesterday would be the anniversary, 1933, he came to power in January. So this was in February, he didn't waste any time. So he took upon himself both the executive and the judiciary, I'm sorry, and the legislative powers. And soon, in, and soon after that, he also took on the judiciary because he organized what was known as Volksgericht, people's courts, which were sham courts, you know, like uh, a, la, a la North Korea and, and, and even China. Uh, you had a boycott of Jewish businesses. So you have all these Jewish businesses are listed by name. George Strauss, who handles uh, 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 grains, and, uh, and the other one is, uh, has a department store, and this one has, a, uh, uh, has iron goods and so on. And you've got the German uh, brown shirts, the, uh, the SA, standing in front of Jewish businesses. Wehrt euch, defend yourself. I don't know against what, but that was what they did. Defend yourself, don't buy from Jews. Uh, they also went into universities, schools, homes, anywhere where there were books, and they burnt the books. Why book burnings? Well, because they don't want you to read what's in the books. They don't want you to know. They only want you to know what they tell you. I was in Berlin a couple of years ago, and there's a big sign on one of the squares, on that square, it says this is where the book burnings took place. So uh, my parents were watching with some anxiety the rise of Nazism. And in Vienna, there was a lot of agitation to prepare the terrain for the Nazis. So how do you prepare the terrain for a dictator? You create unrest. You create unrest in the streets. And then, of course, the people said, we have to have somebody who's going to make order. And that's how Hitler marched into Vienna without a single shot being fired. We left Vienna just six months, literally, before the Nazis marched into Vienna. And we moved to Italy. On the left is a beautiful synagogue in the city of Genoa. Uh, I was new at the time, now I was there, and it's a, it needs a, a sandblasting, it's a little black now, but it's a be beautiful building. And top right is the city of Genoa, and these are pic all pictures taken by, by my brother. <coughs> On the top floor of the synagogue is a, uh, was a school, and my father sent me to this day school. Uh, for me, it was the happiest year of my childhood. I had to learn Italian. And they made me repeat third grade. So my educational story is another, is another story worth telling. But I was very happy. My father was making a living. And uh, I loved Italy. I loved the climate. I loved the sunshine. And, and, uh, and I was having a budding social life. And I was very happy. Well, this lasted uh, one year until Hitler and Mussolini formed the Axis. And this publication, this is a picture of, an, of the La Difesa della Razza, for the defense of the race. So on the left, you have a noble Roman that's separated by a sword from a caricature of a Jew and uh, from a, an African Negro. So the Italians issued the same laws that existed in, in Germany. My father lost his job. My older brother lost his job. My school was closed. And uh, we were told to leave. Now, I, had to, I went to school. Without, I wasn't allowed to go to school with Italian children. I had to go to school separately in the afternoon. And one of the things I noticed, and this is for you guys who are in school, 
we weren't taught anything. I remember we had to memorize the, uh, the, the, the fascist songs, and we had to, uh, we were taught how great the fascia was, you know, in unity there is strength, but uh, no homework, no arithmetic, no grammar, no nothing. So one thing that dictators do is in order to keep you down, they keep you stupid, they keep you ignorant. They don't want you to know. That's why the book burnings, they don't want you to know. And 1938, the situation became unbearable for Jews in both Germany and Austria and Italy. That's when President Roosevelt organized the so-called Avian Conference. And uh, for a whole week, the uh, representatives from various countries sat, enjoyed their dinner and beautiful view of Lake Geneva. And this is a cartoon from that period. You should go, but where? Nobody wanted us. The Italians kicked us out. And I remember my father going to one consulate after another, trying to get a visa. The entire world closed its doors to us. These are cartoons from that period. Go, go, but yeah, but where, if nobody wants you? And so in desperation, my parents decided the Italians kicked us out. You know, we had no residence permit. You gotta go, you gotta go. Uh, so we entered France illegally in 1939. 1938, this is the infamous Munich Agreement in October. Uh, on the left is Chamberlain, who went back to London with this piece of paper saying, peace in our time. And I remember, I was a little girl, I was 10 years old, and I remember thinking, as we say in America, there's going to be war, we're just kicking, the, the, kicking it down the road. And next to him is Daladier, the French Prime Minister, and you know the bad guys on the right. This agreement has become the symbol of appeasement. Try to please a dictator who doesn't have any honor, who will lie. Sure, he said, that's all I want. I just want Austria and the German-speaking part of the Sudeten. And so we sacrificed the Western Allies, France and England, sacrificed Czechoslovakia. Germany took the, the Sudeten. Uh, the Czech, well, the Czech part became, uh, it was under direct German military control, and the Slovaks had a go government that was supportive and sympathetic to the Nazis. And then November is the Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when Jews were attacked, beaten, and the businesses destroyed. It's called Kristallnacht because of the broken glass, the crystals. So this is, this is what was happening. The Italians made us come to the police, and they had to apply here, appartiene alla razza ebraica, and there on top it's the denuncia di appartenenza alla razza ebraica. We belong to the Hebrew race. I didn't know there was a Hebrew race. But it doesn't matter. The truth doesn't matter. You see, in a dictatorship, and when there's uh, prejudice, the truth doesn't matter. So they listed all the family names, and uh, that was our new ID. And, um, and so we entered France illegally, and the French gave us temporary political asylum. Top right is a picture of Nice, the beautiful city of Nice, which I took many years later. And down below was near where we used to live. Here I am, age 12. At that point, we were totally impoverished. Uh, the clothes you see on my back were from charities. And every time I had something nice to wear, to wear my brother would say, come on down, I'll take a picture of you. <laughs> uh, I had to learn French after having learned Italian. And I had, uh, I had decided that I'm not going to repeat third grade or fourth grade. <laughs> so I spent the summer studying French and here I am, uh, if you look at the picture on the right, the last row, I am one, two, three, four, five from the right. I'm wearing something light. I don't know if you can tell, that's me. I am now, what, I'm 10 years old. So I'm with a bunch of little French kids. And you see, this is the size of the classroom. It was huge, there were over 40 children in the classroom. But we learned, I had a good teacher, and we learned. And by the end of the year, I, I had mastered French, and I spoke French like a native, which I still do which came in very handy later on, you will see. On the left is my mom. I am with my mom, I'm 12 now. And uh, in order to, there was a Jewish organization, the Joint Distribution Committee, which provided some support to the refugees. But uh, we used to joke that it's, uh, it's too much to die on, but it wasn't enough to live on. That was the joke. So my parents supplemented uh, the income by uh, taking in laundry from the wealthy refugees, the refugees who, were, who could afford to live in hotels. We would uh, go to their hotels, take the dirty laundry, schlep it up the hill to our house, and there's the laundry on the terrace. 
my mother would iron it, wash it, and iron it, and mend it, and then we would schlep the packages back. Now, this was illegal economic activity, so she used to cover the, the laundry with the vegetables, because <laughs> it was illegal. You weren't allowed to work. The French only had two jobs that were open to uh, foreigners. One was mining, and the other one was agriculture. So uh, as soon as the, this is my dad, pre-war, on the left is still in Vienna, and my brother and niece at the age of 16. As soon as the war broke out, my father was arrested as an enemy alien. He was sent to a camp, Les Milles. This is a picture of Les Milles. This is a brick oven, and that's where the French put human beings. I visited the place, and I saw the graffiti on the wall. This is a brick oven uh, with a concrete floor, and they put a uh, little uh, layer of cement at the bottom, of uh, straw on the bottom, which was not changed. There were not enough washing facilities, and so the inmates called it the vermin capital of the world. Uh, supposedly this was for enemy aliens, but all these camps were filled with Jewish refugees and refugees from Nazi Germany, because there were others who had fled the Nazis, like political opponents. It wasn't just Jews. So. Uh, my father spent nine months there. He was briefly released. He was sick when he was released. And, uh, and here is, here is a, 19, a, a, a topographical map of Europe, which is interesting because the winter of 1939 to 1940, the French declared, the French and the English declared war on, uh, on Germany. And, um, uh, but nothing much was happening because you don't run military campaigns in the winter months. Uh, come the month of May, that was when the Germans started the Blitzkrieg, which means lightning war. So you have, if you look, I don't have a pointer, but you can see the northern European plain from Paris to Moscow. It's one big flat plain. That's how Napoleon went to Moscow in 1812. Well, the Germans did not uh, come to the uh, attack France to the Franco-German border, which is a little mountainous and which was fortified. Instead, they went up north to Holland and Belgium and then headed for Paris and sort of a, a pincer movement. France fell in five weeks to, to everybody's amazement. Nobody expected France to fall so fast. It is still a bad joke, uh, and you will still hear it sometimes referred to, because uh, the French are brave people, but you know, they, they did five weeks. They were unprepared. They didn't expect uh, German speed. I was in Nice at the time, and uh, uh, France was in total chaos. The French government fled from Paris to Bordeaux, and uh, they signed an armistice. And in the armistice, they agreed to send back to Germany all those who had fled Germany, chapter and verse. I don't know if they had to do that. Uh, Denmark was much more honorable. They did not hand over their Jews, France did. So our fate was sealed in a way. After the, this is a picture of Europe, to give you an idea what your, what your fathers or grandfathers or great-grandfathers were up against. The color in light, the light yellow, was under direct German military control by 1942. The, the colors in orange on below are countries that were friendly to Germany, or allies, like Italy and Bulgaria and Romania, Croatia, okay? France was divided into two, the northern half under direct German military control, if you notice, they also took the Atlantic coastline, make sure you couldn't escape through the coast. And the southern half had its capital and the resort town of Vichy, so it came to be known as Vichy France, or so-called Free France, which wasn't free because it was a puppet government. England is up there in pink. In 1940, England stood alone. Some of you may have the handout that I gave you in, with my poem, The Face of Evil, and at the bottom I refer to Winston Churchill, who said in 1940, we shall fight them in the air, we shall fight them on the beaches, we shall fight them in our cities, we will never surrender. He had a moral compass and he galvanized the people of England to fight alone because America did not enter the war for a year and a half. Until when? Do you remember when America entered the war? Yep, the Pearl, Harbor. Pearl Harbor, that's right. Pearl Harbor, December 1941. So from June 1940 until December 41, England fought alone. So my hat's off to Churchill. He saved Europe from, from decades of enslavement to this. 
Notice that the Germans were at the gates of Moscow. See where Moscow is all the way on the right. Well, my father was released briefly, and within a couple of days, he, both he and my brother were arrested. There was that knock on the door at the crack of dawn. We were all in bed. Two French policemen came to the door and said to my father and my brother, my brother had just turned 17, uh, you have 30 minutes to get dressed, pack your bags, and say goodbye to your family. And that's the last time I saw my father. My brother, they were both sent to a camp, the camp of Gurs, in the south western part of France. And after a year in that camp, my brother escaped. And he went, uh, we joined us, but he couldn't stay at our house because we were afraid he would get picked up. And so here he is with a, um, it was called, a, a, it was on a, um, uh, like a farm outside of the city of Nice, where they were preparing young men and young women to go to Palestine to and work the land. So it was called Hakshara. Uh, needless to say, I forgot to mention that during the 30s and the 40s, when Jews were desperate in Europe, Britain closed the door to Palestine under pressure from the Arab world. The Mufti of Jerusalem was a close friend of Hitler's. He was visiting Hitler, you know, they were, had the same ideology. It's not well known. And he's the Mufti of Jerusalem was also the teacher for Yasser Arafat. So, you know, ideas, ideas just work their way through for generations. Everything starts with ideas. Well, my brother couldn't stay there, so he ended up joining a French paramilitary outfit, which was a disaster. But in the meantime, France was occupied, and you notice here, Yiddish's Geschäft, Entreprise de Juive. So they let you know that this is a Jewish business. Don't go there. And here you have, in those days, they were still repairing fountain pens. Sounds so funny today but the uh, réparation de stylo. And you have changement de direction, which means new management. So Jews just had to walk out and hand over their business to, to quote, Aryans. I didn't know they were Aryans. That's a misnamer anyway, but, so uh, you, just, you just lost your livelihood. My mother and I, we were still in Nice, while my father and my brother were in those camps, and Nice was too nice and was forbidden to Jews. So they said, you gotta go. So here I am on the left. I still look like a schoolgirl. I'm 13 years old. No more school. We go to a little village in the southwestern part of France. And on the right, that's me at the age of 14. I'm a peasant. I work in the vineyards. I put in a 10-hour day, eight hours in the vineyards, and two hours walking to and from the fields. And my brother joined this uh, French unit where they had a unit for foreign workers, and they put him to work, working in a quarry. On the right is the last picture I have of my brother. I would have felt better if my brother had died standing up, fighting for the values he believed in, instead of being starved to death, dehumanized, before being shoved into the gas chamber. And the Israelis remember that. That's why they fight like lions. It's the best army in the world. 1940, uh, December 1941, January 1942, was the infamous Wannsee Conference. That's when our destiny was determined, decided by Hitler. Why? Because nobody wanted us. The whole world closed its doors to Jews who were desperate. And our strength consists in our speed and in our brutality. His role model was Genghis Khan. Only thus, and, and so he wants to kill Poles in addition to Jews. They're going to be merciless. Only thus shall we gain the living space, the living psalm that we need. Who, after all, speaks today of the annihilation or the genocide of the Armenians? For those of you who don't know, the Armenians were murdered en masse, one and a half million Armenians in 1916 by the Turks. And he was right. People forgot about the Armenian genocide. That's why there are many Armenians in the United States and in France and all over the world. They had to flee. And so in January 20, 1942, that's when the so-called final solution was decided. I hate that term. There's no such thing as a final solution. It is a disgrace. The mass murder of uh, Europe's Jews was decided. This is a map of the concentration camps in France. All the stars of David you see are concentration camps. Some are small, some are big. 
The one on the bottom left, Gurs, is where my father and my brother were sent initially. Then my father was moved to Rivazalt on the bottom right. From there, he was shipped to uh, uh, Drancy, which is just outside of Paris. If you go to Paris today and you take the, uh, a bus or a train or a taxi from the airport to the city, you will be passing by the suburb of Drancy where they were housed. It was a new housing development, and that's what they, they packed Jews in there. And uh, in Drancy, they were processed because the Germans were very thorough. They kept records. And uh, so we have those records. And then from after a few days in, uh, in uh, Drancy, they were packed into cattle cars without food, without water, without sanitation, three days and three nights to Auschwitz. Each convoy made up of about a thousand people, and within two hours they were, quote, processed, and most of them were murdered. So those who were in the train, those who survived, typically between two and ten per thousand survived. Needless to say, when the train left within a few hours, if you pardon my French, people were walking around in because there was no sanitation. My brother was in uh, other camps. He was in. Uh, he started out in Girls. He ended up in Bra in Brahms and Act, uh, and and then he too went to uh, Drancy, processed, and shipped to Auschwitz. This would be a convoy of uh, women and children who were already in a ghetto. Guess where they are heading for? Straight to the gas chamber. And this would be a convoy probably from Hungary, uh, where on the right are the men, the women on the left. And here's your Nazi who is well-fed, well-dressed, standing there and deciding who shall live and who shall die. It was Dr. Mengele, who was a physician. I don't know what he did with the Hippocratic Oath. He decided who shall live and who shall die and who shall be subject to medical experiments. 1,000 people processed in two hours. And they kept records. These are the records. These are just copies of actual records. So on the top is my, uh, my father's name. He was deported on 9-11. Not a good date, 1942. And my brother was deported uh, August 31, 1942. On the bottom is his, his name. They misspelled both, but anyway, it's their name and their birth date and citizenship, Autrichien. So I'm in that village and they're out to kill us all. So I can't stay in the village. My mother's contacted by a member of the Jewish underground, the organization. There were a number of networks that were trying to save kids. And uh, the, one, the one that helped me were the Jewish Scouts of France, Eclaireur Israelite de France, and their nickname was the Sixième, the Sixth. Uh, so she said, they said I should go into hiding. I didn't want to go. I was now 14. My father was gone, my brother was gone, I didn't want to leave. I was also, my mother was very bossy and I was very dependent on her and I didn't like the idea of leaving. But I was raised, I came from a very traditional Jewish family where you dressed with a certain modesty, you didn't wear your shorts up to here, you didn't uh, wear your neckline, you know, showing what you had, and you watched your language at the dinner table. My father used the coarse word, he would apologize to the honor of the dinner table. For those who know Yiddish, anybody, the kavot, the honor of the table. And uh, so I was afraid of being sexually abused and shamed. That to me was my greatest fear. So I went into hiding and I became somebody else. I was hidden in plain sight. Not like Anne Frank, physically hidden, but in plain sight. Since I speak French like a native, I could pass for French. On the left is my fake birth certificate. Um, I had, my name was changed from Edith Meyer to Elise Maillet. And my parents were given very French uh, sounding names. And I was Roman Catholic, non-practicing. So the top right is my first hiding place. It was a Catholic school for girls. It was a high school, uh, vocational high school for girls. And I'm in the front row on the bottom left, sitting there. Um, it was very difficult to be in hiding because uh, it sounds exciting, but it wasn't. Because, first of all, I wasn't familiar with Catholic ritual. Uh, number two, I didn't have enough familiarity with Catholic girls, even though I'd always lived in Catholic countries. Uh, 
And of course I made a mistake the first Sunday I was there, which had consequences. Uh, the girls were nice. The girls were nice. They were not. They were nice kids. But um, I had to be on my guard at all times. Every word, every gesture had to be controlled. And, and I could never share a real thought with anybody. I could never say what I thought or how I felt. And I couldn't keep a diary because you can't. If somebody finds it, you're done for. So it creates a sense of tension. And since I was hidden for about a year, the tension grows and grows and grows until you think you're going to explode, literally. Well, I spent the summer there after the school, school was out. I spent the summer working in their day camp. And uh, uh, when fall came, I was told only the mother superior knew who I was. When fall came, school was about to start. Mother superior calls me in and she says, you've been found out. You got to go. And I was gone the next day. How was I found out? As I say, the girls were nice kids. But they took that photograph home with them over the summer and they showed it around to their family and to their friends. And somebody from my village says, oh, I know who she is. That's not her real name. Et voila. And that's how I was found out. I was gone the next day. Well, I went uh, uh, in a hurry. There was no time to find another hiding place. So I was sent to Moissac, which was at the, the home for the Jewish Scouts of France. But this is 1943. They were after all of us, including kids. So in 1943, the home was already in the process of being disbanded. And uh, anyway, I get to Mossack on a Friday. Saturday morning, I wake up with a terrible sore throat. They ship me off to the hospital. I have diphtheria. I'm so glad you are vaccinated. This is an awful illness. Because the throat membranes swell. You can't swallow, and you suffocate. Uh, and I remember when I was in France, you still met people who had a scar here uh, because they had to co cut open the trachea so they could breathe. Otherwise, they died from just asphyxiation. I was very sick. For a whole month, I was sick. Just as I was getting better, I come down with scarlet fever. And at that point, I lost the will to live. I lost the will to fight. Because to be in hiding like that, you had to keep your spirits up. You had to keep the will to fight. And so I wrote a letter to my mother on toilet paper telling her I couldn't take it anymore. Because remember, for me, the persecution started at the age of 10. I was now 15. My brother was gone. My father was gone. I didn't know if my mother survived or not. And I wrote to her, we're all going to die sooner or later, which unfortunately we did. And I'm going to die with her. I don't want to die alone. Well, I survived. I got better. <laughs> the doctor said I was run down, which I was. So the home, show you the dedication of the people, of the counselors. Twice a day, they would send kids from the home to bring me the food from the home to supplement the rations from the hospital, because rationing was very severe. And this way, I, I could make up in quantity what I didn't get in quality. It wasn't good for the waistline, but at least I got some nutrition. Well, as you can see, I survived. Uh, and I went to another hiding place. Uh, and when Christmas came, they couldn't, um, there was no place for us. We couldn't go home. The other kids went home. We couldn't go home. So they took all the teenagers who were in hiding in various schools and institutions and boarding schools. And they organized at the bottom right this scout camp uh, we pretended to be Protestant scouts, and uh, uh, boys and girls, as you can see, we're all teenagers. I am down here up front, I think. Um, where am I? I'm back there with the little bow tie. And, uh, and they did everything they could to boost our morale. We sang Hebrew songs, we had an ornaic. The, we talked about the, uh, the future, we talked about the state, the Jewish state, it was about our dreams. And for two weeks, they did everything to boost our morale. At the end of the two weeks, I get called into the head of the camp. And like a kid, you know, I said, ah, I'm sure I get pulled out, I must have done something wrong, right? You get called into the head of the camp. Well, he pulls out the letter I wrote to my mother on toilet paper. And he said, we, we, thought, we took the liberty of reading your letter. We thought your mother might feel bad if she sees it. So, but if you want to, we'll give it to her. Well, by that time, my spirits had been turned around, and I tore up the letter, and I wrote another one. I went from there to another hiding place, and had applied hiding place. I once added it up. I moved 13 times in one year. I was always on the go, from one hiding place to another. 
Well, things were getting very hot because they were out to kill kids. They took, uh, there was a home outside of Lyon, home called Isieux, 42 children, young children, grade school children. They were denounced, and the man who became known as the butcher of Lyon, Klaus Barbie, arrested the children, 42, straight to Auschwitz, straight to the gas chamber. So we had to, they were trying to get us out of France. And uh, so I crossed into Switzerland illegally with uh, 30 teenagers and a five-year-old. That's the first story I wrote down because it was so dramatic. In Switzerland, here I am. I was uh, not in good health. I had TB when I got to Switzerland. By the way, on top right is the young woman, Marianne Korn, who uh, le led my group to the border. The group of children the following week was also led to the border, but they were caught. They were caught, they were imprisoned in the city of, uh, of Anamas. The children were saved because the mayor of Anamas intervened and the Archbishop of Nice intervened. But she was brutally murdered. She is now a heroine of, the, of French resistance. She was all of 21 years old. That's her memorial, as far as I'm concerned. In Switzerland, I still didn't go to school. I'm working as a nanny. The, on the right is a home for Jewish boys, as you can see, 8 to 14. And uh, I'm taking care of the kid of the, the directors of the home. They were also refugees. Everybody was a refugee. Uh, and I was worried at that point. The uncertainty was enormous. There was no news. You couldn't, I couldn't write to my mother. I didn't know what was going on in Germany. I kept a diary the day I got to Switzerland. And in my diary, I expressed my concerns about my family, hard labor, exposure, no medical care, but not in a million years did I ever imagine that men are capable of doing what the Nazis did. So I thought if my, my father survives, he would be sick, I need to be able to get a job, I gotta be able to work, I had no skills. So when I was in Switzerland, and there again is the idea of, of a Jewish state, Jewish homeland. I thought, if nobody survives, I have no skills. I'm 16 years old. I'll go to, to Israel. They'll take care of me. They'll teach me something. And some of us did. Some, some of the, my the fellow survivors, they ended up in Israel, and they were taught the trade, and they were able to make a living. Because what do I do? I had nobody left. So that was my thinking. Well, my mother survived, so I went back to France, and I had... Uh, I had a lot of work to do, but I want you to see the map. Little Israel, surrounded by all these Arab countries. You wouldn't believe that such a little country makes so many headlines. <laughs> and, and they wouldn't let us have that little bit of space up there, which is not even the whole uh, red part, because the, you know, the, the West Bank is, not, uh, is carved out, remember? So when, the, when the, uh, the, the point I want to make is when the war of independence in Israel started and Jews were kicked out from all these countries where they had lived for millennia since the Babylonian exile. There were ancient Jewish communities in Iran, in Iraq, in Morocco, on all of North Africa. They had a place to go to. We did not. That's why we were killed. They had a place to go to. Well, after the war, I had a triple task. I had to come to terms spiritually with the horror of the Nazis. I had to get an education, and I had to make a living. There was no help. We had nothing. I had no country, I had no money, I had no education, I had no support. I had nothing. My mother had survived. The clothes you see on our backs were sent by an American relative. So we lived in this slum house, bottom left, uh, where there were four tiny apartments. Each apartment consisted of two minuscule rooms. I slept in the kitchen on a folding bed, and during the day we folded the bed and we opened up a folding table. And I wanted an education. I wanted an education more than anything else. By the way, there was no, that place had no, uh, no uh, plumbing. There was an outhouse shared by four families, which was a hole in the ground. Get the picture? And the neighbors used to miss. It was disgusting. And then I had to get water at the fountain up the block. Every day I schlepped the buckets to a pitcher in a bucket. 
And to do the laundry, I would do it in the hair, and then I rinse it but at the fountain. Well, I told everybody I wanted an education, and I met, I was introduced to a social worker who said, I have enough money for one year, get a scholarship for one year, but you have to catch up six years in one. I said, please. She said, that's all the money I got. Take it or leave it. So I took it. So this is for you folks. I had to learn. I had a sixth grade education. I knew how to read and write and count. I had to learn algebra, geometry. I had to apply my, my algebra to geometric problems. I had to uh, learn how to write a literary research paper. I had to know French literature, French intellectual history. And I, had, I didn't even have a, a, a calendar year. I had a school year, an academic year. Well, I was determined I didn't do anything that year but study, 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 study. I didn't go on a date, I didn't go to the movies, I didn't do anything. I used to take off Sunday morning to either go for a swim or a walk. And I passed the baccalaureate at the end of that year, then I second baccalaureate, in those days they, in those days they had two. And then I got, went to the University of Toulouse, got a degree roughly equivalent to a master's, and then they came to, I came to the United States. Remember in 1945, I wanted to come to the United States. The United States said, you have to wait your quota. Would have been nice if I could have come in 1945. Would have made my life a lot easier. I could have gone to high school and move on academically, but no. No, you have to wait your quota. So after six years, it, it took them a whole year to vet me. We're making such a fuss now about vetting. Boy, was I vetted. Had I ever been a communist? Had I ever been a Nazi? Where did I live? I had to give them all the addresses. I said, I said to myself, have fun, you know, all the addresses where I lived. <laughs> and, uh, and do I have any mental problems? Had I ever been arrested? I had to go to a doctor approved by the, uh, by the American authorities and strip to make to show that I didn't have any physical blemishes. Boy, was I vetted before I was allowed to come to this country. It was a reference to be here. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any money after the baccalaureate, so I took this job as a sales girl. Now, this is America, which is fine. This job is fine in America. In France, it was the bottom. It was so looked down upon that my mother was criticized. For this, you let her study? Well, when you are starving, you do whatever you can. This was a terrible job. I worked 18, 16 to 18 hours a day and on those outdoor markets called foire. And I did that for three summers in a row. That was my boss. He was, he was also Jewish. He was, uh, he was trained to be a chemical, uh, to be an, uh, uh, he had a degree in agronomy. But uh, like all the Jews of Europe at that time, you had to pick up the pieces and make a living. So that was an easy way to, you didn't need much capital. You just needed some merchandise and, and a tent. And you went every day, you went to a different town to pitch the tent and sell your wares. It wasn't a high class job. This is what I looked like when I came to America. On the left is a dress I made myself. I was tired of not having clothes, so I made myself a simple dress because I didn't have any money to buy them in the stores. And this is sort of a design I made, <laughs> um, which symbolizes my climb out of the hole. On the left is my dark clouds, broken chains, thunder and lightning, and very, very, very slowly I go to the light. I don't know how to draw, so this is cartoon-like. Well, there are still people who say it didn't happen. Unfortunately for them, the Germans kept records. So these are records from, they're in Bad Arlsen. Uh They have now been digitized, so they're available to everybody. And the question I ask is, how did the Nazis do that? I mean, you go to Germany, everybody likes Germany now. They're nice people. They're civilized. They've been converted to Christianity at the time of Charlemagne for over a thousand years. I don't know what they did with their Christianity, though. <coughs> when they were killing us, but they're nice people. So how did they do it? Massive propaganda and lies, censorship and mind control, indoctrination of the young, manipulation through favors. Anytime they took a business or money or, or assets away from Jews, they gave it to their cronies. That's what North Korea does. The guy in North Korea gives it to his cronies. Same thing. Threats, violence, and murder, use of force, okay. So this is Goebbels. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. So you have to repeat it, and over and over and over and over. Okay? The truth is the moral enemy of the lie. And the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. That's Goebbels. So everybody had, it was mandatory for everybody to own a radio. Radios were new at the time. This was before television. And so people, why did they have to have a radio? because uh, they had to hear Hitler's speeches. They were mesmerizing. He had trained himself to give mesmerizing speeches. 
you know, in German, the verb is at the end, so don't, you don't really know what the meaning of the sentence is until you get to the very end of the sentence. Uh, to show you the degree to which the Germans were brainwashed, 1943, this is after America entered the war, after the, uh, the Battle of, Ta of Stalingrad, which was a turning point, 1942, that was a, a turning point. Germans lost massive numbers of young soldiers. They were still telling the German people, motto, 1943, without stopping to final victory. And I want you to notice who the villains are, the, the Russians, the Americans, the Brits, and of course, the Jews. We're in good company without stopping to final victory. And the Germans believed it. You know, the Italians did in their own dictator, not the Germans. They waited for us to do it. If you listen to a foreign radio station like the BBC, you were a traitor, you were sent to a prison or to a concentration camp. So that's the traitor. Verreter means traitor. A personality cult and indoctrination of the young. Any boy age 8, 10, 10 had to join the Hitler Youth, mandatory. And then look at the little girl. You too belong to the Fuhrer. Ladies, if somebody told you you belong to the president, and I don't care which president, you would tell them to go take a hike. <laughs> and you would be right. But no, but no, they did. You belong to the Fuhrer. You didn't belong to yourself. You belong to the state. In a dictatorship, you belong to the state. And you do the will of the state. You don't have a life of your own. I, I find this particularly offensive. I don't know why, but this, this, this really pushes my button. You belong to the Fuhrer. So when bribes didn't work, there were threats, beatings, arrests, and then indiscriminate terror and murder. And if you think only Jews were persecuted, anybody who disagreed with the regime. On the left is uh, Daniel Trockme, who is the nephew of the pastor who, uh, who um, was, head, was the pastor in a village in the southern part of France. He was a Huguenot. And the Huguenots were persecuted by the French because the French were Catholic. So they knew what persecution was like. So they opened up their doors to everybody who stopped there. Adults, children, everybody. Uh, the uh, villagers survived, the pastor survived, but his nephew, Daniel, was killed. In the middle you have Father Maximilian Kolbe, who was a Catholic priest who opposed the Nazis. He was murdered in Auschwitz. And on the right you have Dietrich Bonhoeffer, what a, a Protestant theologian who was arrested because he opposed the Nazis. He wrote letters from prison, which have been translated. You may have seen them in English. And just literally days before the Allies could liberate him, the Germans shot him, wouldn't let him live. So I don't want to leave you on a, uh, on a negative uh, note. Uh, some of you have the handout I gave you, of the 10 lessons from my life. And the last lesson is a quote from Pierre Curie. Il faut faire de sa vie un rêve et de son rêve une réalité. We must make of our life a dream and then turn that dream into reality. In other words, we are the ones who create our lives. We are the ones who create our future. So the future is in our hand and it starts with the thoughts we put into our heads. Thank you very much. <laughs>